have your Bibles, open them up to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy is uh, way back at the front of the, the Bible in the Old Testament. Uh, you've got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's number 5 in what we consider the, the book of, of the law. Um, and we are going to explore um, leaving something behind. And, and, you know, over the last, I don't know, my life um, following Jesus, uh, 22 years since the Lord saved me, uh, there's been one thing that hopefully I do every time I get up to preach, and that is to open the Word of God and use it. Um, it's pretty important, by the way, guys, for the preacher to actually use the Bible and it actually says what it is he's saying that it says. Pretty, would you agree that's important? And so we're going to do that today, but you know, it's really important and it's essential uh, for every single one of us. All of, our, all of our lives, all of our existence, uh, for those of you that are in Christ today, we have the Word of of God. And I think a lot of times what we have trouble with is, is we are deciphering this thing called life and we sometimes we have no clue. But I promise you, if you will look through everything, do you hear me? Everything, everything in life through the Bible and read the Bible and get your inspiration and get your uh, knowledge, uh, your doctrine, your theology, all of those things from the Bible first in our decision-making process, you would be surprised at how much better our world would go. Do you hear me? We've heard a lot of this... Uh, We've heard uh, 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 lots of, of, of things in our world and see lots of things in our world that are contrary to what it is the Word of God says, but we just say in our mind, that well, that's just how it is. And the church has got to get a totally different mindset and say, well, no, that's not how it is. Just because that is the reality that we are living doesn't necessarily make it reality. Do you understand what I'm saying? We've got to get our reality from what the Word of God has to say about it. Do y'all hear me? We've got to get our reality from what the Word of God has to say about it. Not what's going on in culture around us. What does the Word of God say on this particular subject? That's my challenge to you this morning. And that is the challenge that we find in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And the whole deal, the whole thrust of this message this morning is leaving something behind. A legacy, a heritage, a tradition. It doesn't really matter what you call it. We have got to leave something behind for the next generation. Something that lasts. You know, I think in human terms that there's things that I want to leave behind for my children. I think they need to know how to hunt and fish. Because one day the proverbial, you know what's going to hit the fan and they ain't going to be able to go to Walmart. They need to know how to skin a deer. They need to know how to clean a fish. They need to know how to cook that food. Moms and dads, it's important that we teach our kids something. You've heard me say before, it's important for me, for my boys, to know how to read a tape measure that doesn't have those little cheaty numbers on it. One eight, one quarter. You understand what I'm saying? But they got the cheats on there. They need to know what the biggie and the little e means. And the other little Lily. They need, I just feel like that's important. They need to know how to do things with their hands. They need to know how to use some sort of tools. They, they, they need to know how to work if there ain't a computer gig down the road. You know what I'm talking about? They need to know how to do stuff. We want to teach our kids how to read. And how to write and how to add and subtract. So many of these things that we teach our children day after day after day, it's going to last and it's hopefully going to help them moving forward. You know, I want to teach my kids good work ethic. When they get fired from a job or they lose a job or their business goes under for whatever reason and something they're apart, I want them to have the tenacity the mm about them to not be afraid to go down to the river and roll grapevines to sell or to split firewood if they have to rather than sitting back relying on the government to pay for everything. 
Some of y'all need to go get a job. You'll know where some grapevines are, ask me. But see, we live in a culture where nobody wants to do that, so I think it's important for my kids to learn how to work. Uh, uh. Do you agree with that? Some people can't work, man. They're injured or hurt or half dead. I'm, I'm not talking to you, okay? But able-bodied people, they need to get off their lazy hind ends and do something. That's part of the problem with our country. But the bigger problem is about what I'm about to talk about here in a minute when we open up our text. I want to leave something behind for my children and my grandchildren and on if Jesus doesn't come back first, y'all. One of the things I hope to do one day, and it may be a cheesy dream, I, you know, I have no idea, it may be visions of grandeur on my behalf, but hopefully one day some of my adult children will not hate the cattle business so bad as that one day we'll partner up on some deals. And we'll be in the cattle business together and maybe expand a little bit on our operation. I'm hoping that for at least a couple of my four boys. For Marley, I'm hoping she'll be a doctor so she can patch me up. <laughs> doctor on me whenever I get decrepit and we're still doing silly stuff. Hey, watch this, you know, uh, type deals. Um, you know how that usually works out for me. And hopefully if she's a doctor, she'll be rich enough to bail me out, you know, whenever I blow all my money on the latest and greatest deal that's about to happen. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was away in Texas, and uh, the boys, I left on a Wednesday morning first thing, so I wasn't around the ranch at all on Wednesday and didn't come back till Sunday morning, and so I was out. I, was, I, was, I couldn't do nothing, and so I relied on two people that are under the age of 18, under the age of, 16, under the age of 13, um, really, uh, to handle riding pens and doctoring cattle that were fresh. I mean, this wasn't just like a normal deal. They went out, Canaan and Isaac, 12 and 8 years old, went out, and they worked a job Wednesday through Saturday as men. And then Ray had to have some sort of deal ripped out of his mouth, a tooth that was all jacked up. Let him tell you the story. It's amazing. And right before I left, and I mean, like the, the day after I left, he was like going and letting them cut on his mouth. And so Canaan and Isaac were prepared to run everything, run feed trucks and set out hay. And I mean, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, just, you know, 10 or 15 calves. I mean, I'm talking about a whole lot bigger deal than that. They worked as men. And Ray, you worked as a man too because Ray sucked it up and got the job done, which is what I need him to do. But Canaan and Isaac, they had a lot of responsibility and worked some pretty long days to get those things accomplished, but they did it like men. You know how they learned how to do that? Their daddy taught them. Do you hear me? I'm passing on a legacy, one maybe they hate one day when they live in the city, okay, and got sprinklers that pop up in their front yard when they go to get their newspaper in the morning. That, that may be their life, okay, no manure or mud. But I'm teaching them a legacy, and I'm handing off the things. And when we ride those pins, Kenny, you know, I learned from this, so much from this man right here, and I've learned a lot from a lot of y'all other too, but I, we riding in those pins, and I'm saying, man, look, well, I mean, what did that calf do when he gets up? Does he get up and does he stretch? Or does he get up and <coughs> he needs to go? Does he look full? Is there something coming out of his nose or his eyes or something out of his rear end that don't look like it very good? Does he look depressed? Is he off by himself? They've heard me say it over and over and over and over. And sometimes we'll ride pins and I'll be, Canaan's got a real good eye for him and Isaac's working on his eye for him. And I mean, Canaan's probably getting a better eye than I am, I think sometimes, because there's times when he catches something and I tell myself, well, I let that one go on purpose so maybe he'll see it. But no, actually, I missed it. And he says, don't you think this one, yeah, buddy, we need to get that, come back. He tempts, sure enough, man, he need to be doctored on. Because it's about learning to ride through pens of cattle and doctor on something before it even itself knows that it needs to be doctored. Catching cattle before they themselves even know that they're sick in order to be able to help them. Anybody can drive down the road and see a sick calf. It's too late for that sucker most of the time. How do they know? Their dad taught them. I am passing on the knowledge that was taught to me and there's so many of the things that you do right now in your careers whether you build houses or or you're an artist or whatever it is that you got going on and, and something that you learned to do your dad taught you or someone else taught you and you were passing that on to the next generation and it is important to you but let me tell you 
There is something even more important than all of that. There is a heritage, there is a legacy, there is something that you have got to pass down that is so much more important than any of the other things that I've talked about. You see, I'm proud when I can leave on a Wednesday and come back on a Sunday and they took care of business. I didn't have to come back through there Monday and pull a bunch of calves that they missed out with a tractor and a chain. You know what I'm talking about? That's right. Because they're not rushed, they're concentrated. Not thinking about the next thing. But something that has in, it just encouraged me more than that, to hear my boys sit in a Bible study with mostly adults or all adults except for them and then be able to have an intelligent conversation about the Word of God and what it has to say on whatever it is we're talking about. How do they know that? Their daddy taught them. Their mama taught them. It's the way that it should be. Do you understand, folks? You think of all the things that you have learned in your lifetime. Some of the things kids at school told you. Some of the things you read on the bathroom wall. Don't you wish your mom and dad would have told you how it really is? Would it have saved you a bunch of heartaches? Would it have saved you a bunch of trouble if someone would have passed on to you the knowledge that you have now back then? I say yay. Our text this morning is Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's start in verse 1. This is Moses talking to the people of Israel. He says, now this is the commandment, the statues, and the judgment which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it. So not only are you going to be taught, but you need to do them once you've been taught. Verse 2. So that you and your son and your grandson may fear the Lord your God to keep all of his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel... The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your sons. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning and thank you, Lord, that we have your word of God. May we read it and live it and apply it in all areas. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, we got to learn how to leave a real inheritance. Guys, we've got something to give. Do y'all realize that? If you were a follower of the Lord Jesus, you have something to give. Now listen, Israel possessed all sorts of stuff. They possessed their families and herds and clothing and, and shelter and all these things. But the greatest possession, and that's what Moses is teaching them and what Moses is teaching us right now, the greatest possession that they have and you and I have is the Word of God, God's law. His Word, it is right now and should be right now our greatest possession. You know, you think your greatest possession is probably stored in a safe somewhere. At the house, it's fireproof and burglar-proof, but that's actually not. Actually, the greatest possession that you have as a believer of Jesus Christ is this Word right here. The problem is, is we don't pick it up enough. The problem is we don't have no idea what it says about the things that we think about and the things that we do and where we go. I mean, we don't don't have no clue about this thing. God's law, his word, what do we do with it? What do we do and what should we do with God's word? The first thing we got to do is we got to take them in our heart. Look at verse 6. It says, these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Listen to me. It is not just enough to try, 
try to obey God outwardly. You cannot get it accomplished, guys. You cannot be perfect. You have got to be perfect, and there is nobody in here perfect. Look over at your neighbor and say, you ain't perfect. Oh, it ain't good enough, y'all guys. We need to run the air a little lower. Look at your neighbor and say, you ain't perfect. Look at me and say, hey, look right here at me and say, you ain't perfect either, preacher. I agree. Anybody that knows me knows that's right. I want you to understand this real quick. The Word of God, it demands a response from y'all and me. It demands a response. The question is, will you receive what the Word of God has to say through the power of the Holy Spirit and let it change you, or will you say, I don't know about that? We have to take the words of God personally and let it be at the very center of who it is we are and what it is we believe. It's taking the Word of God and seeing our world through it. It's totally changing, guys. It's totally changing the way we see everything, the way we make our decision, and the way we make our choices based on what the Word of God has to say. And let me just tell you what happens whenever we do uh, and look at the world the way uh, God sees it and says that it is, and we go, oh, yeah, this makes sense. When we do that, let me tell you the things that it will affect. It will affect our marriages. When you take the Word of God and you learn what a man's supposed to do and what a woman's supposed to do, how they're supposed to interact, guess what it's going to do? It's going to change and revolutionize your marriage. Anybody in here got a crappy marriage? Don't answer that. (laughs) Have you looked to see what the Word of God has to say about marriage? Wives, have you looked to see what your part is? Husbands, have you looked to see what your part is? It'll change your marriage, but it also changes your parenting. Guys, I'll be honest with you, guys. Sometimes I am a terrible parent. And it takes the Word of God in my life to teach me and show me what it is that I need to do. The book of Ephesians tells me that I should not provoke my children. But guess what I am in life? A provoker because I'm a real butthole sometimes. (laughs) And some of you, you are too. Sometimes I'm looking for that gig. Boy, I just really want to get a rise out of somebody so I can execute my authority. That's a failure on my part. I don't tell you that to laugh. I'm telling you that is the way that I am. And so what do I have to do? I have to go back to the Word of God and let it kick me square in the tail and say, no. Guys, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I read the Word of God and I don't like what it says. It hurts me because it's growing me. It's the pruning process I talked about last week that we found in the Gospel of John. It's God pruning the junk in my life that that doesn't bring Him any glory. It changes our parenting. It changes our ministries. When we began to look through the Word of God, it's hard to believe that a ministry could exist apart from the Word of God, but yeah, it can. That goes all the way from even up to teaching and preaching ministries. Because we hear a lot of facts and a lot of opinions based on what somebody thinks versus what the Bible has to say about it. And then we find ourselves in America like we are right now with lots and lots of problems and troubles because we haven't looked to the Word of God. And so there's been things that have crept in unnoticed within the church that the book of Jude talks about. It all scared the crap out of you. It also affects the areas of our jobs. Who are we working for? What it is we're doing? Our politics, oh, oh, it'll change, guys. When we start looking at these candidates through what the Word of God says a godly man is, if we're wanting to get back to a godly nation, the church has got to turn back to Jesus, and then the politicians won't have no other choice but to look to the church and say, oh, yeah, that's the way I'm supposed to be. But now look what we got. 
All of them. Every last one of them cotton pickers. I ain't calling no names, but that's what I think of all of them. Look to the Word, guys. See what the Bible thinks about them. I'm just saying. It'll change our politics. It'll change our world. It will change all areas in our life. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5 says that we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Guys, that is everything you think about. All areas of life. Marriage, parenting, ministries, jobs, politics, your world. Are we taking them and lining them side by side with the word of God and saying, what do you have to say about this, God? I promise you he's got something to say about all those areas. Psalm 119.11 says, Your word I have treasured. Notice that word treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. How do I treasure God's word? Because I read it and I apply it and I say, God, this is worth more than anything else I got. What do we do and what should we do with God's word? Look at verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up what should we do what do we do with the word of God we've got to teach them to our kids we've got to teach them to our children parents mean well I I mean well I want to leave an inheritance to my children I I think that's a biblical concept I, I want them to be better off than what was left to me which was Jack Diddley squat Some of y'all the same way. Ann and I started off at minus something, a car payment her daddy gave me, you know. So I was actually in the hole. I didn't start at zero. I was minus seven or 8,000 whenever I got into this deal. I want, to leave a, I want to leave an inheritance for my children, but the most important thing that I know, if I don't leave them anything, guys, the most important thing that I can leave them is a love for the Word of God, to encourage them to look at their life and their marriage and their parenting and their politics and their world and their jobs and all those things through what the Word of God has to say about those things. We're supposed to talk about his word when we sit when we talk when we lie down when we get up we got to talk about Jesus all the time tell them about what the Lord has to say about things not just on Sunday I love to see a a, a day when it of course I hate rain at this moment because all the mud so I'm not going to curse it but I don't really enjoy it right at this moment but I, I love days when it rains and all of a sudden the sun comes out and then it creates a rainbow to say to my children, do you know what that is? Yes, that's a rainbow. Do you know who is sending us a rainbow today for us to see and to remember his promise to Noah that he would never destroy the earth again by water? Isn't it amazing, God's promises, and let that again. And I hope one day they'll tell that to my grandchildren and so on and so forth if Jesus doesn't come back between now and then. The conversation about the Lord Jesus should be inside the house. It should be outside the house. The conversation about the Lord Jesus should start in the morning. When should it end? At night. What do we do? And what should we do with God's word? We got to be directed by him. Look at verse 8. It says, You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. We have got to be directed by the word of God. We, it says that we should write them on our hands, our foreheads, and door frames of our houses as a reminder of the most treasured possession, God's word, that you have. So hand, head, homes, basically three H's that I see there. When we meditate and study on God's word guess what it's going to do it's going to do the part of the hand it's going to direct us what it is we do with our hands guys our actions will change when the word of God is on our hands and I don't mean go out and get a tattoo like God loves or something I'm not that's not what this is talking about it's talking about the direction 
the way we walk, the way we talk, the places and things we participate in, where you find your body, they have got to change. Are the things that you are currently doing right now, the things in your life, do they honor God's Word? Are they lining up with the Scripture, the actions that you take physically each day? When it's on our heads, and it doesn't mean get it tattooed across your forehead, when it's on our heads, it changes our worldview. The way we think about things. What used to be okay is no longer okay. Frontals is basically between your eyeballs. And what if you go past your eyeballs through your skull, what's there? Your brain. Very good. The word has got to be in your head. How does it get in your head? You look at it and read it and apply it. I mean, this is all simple stuff, guys. It's all pretty elementary. The fact of the matter is, sometimes when I go to pick up the Bible, I have trouble because I have 88, I have like all these numbers after my letter or after my name, ADHD, NAACP or something like that. I forget what all they supposed to be on medication you know I dropped that when I was eight you know I dropped that's like you know I couldn't handle that no more I was done so when I look at the Bible I can't like read a whole chapter in one sitting it 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 it, it I mean it starts jacking me up you know I start wandering from here and there so what I encourage people to do that are a lot like me and maybe they're not real big readers is to just take a few verses in context and study just on that take it in absorb it memorize it, learn it, understand what it is you're saying. You're a whole lot better off than to get on there and try to read five or six chapters in a setting than to concentrate, and this is the better thing, to concentrate on just five or six verses at a time and actually understand what it says and take it in and absorb it and apply it and use it for the glory of Jesus. But when it's in our hand, heads, when it's in our minds, in our brains, guys, it changes everything. So we got the hands, we got the heads. What about the homes? I, I'm going to take this as literal, and I'm going to say the Word of God needs to be posted at your house. There needs to be a, a copy of the Word of God somewhere located on a coffee table or an end table somewhere where it is viewable, but most importantly, where you don't have to dust it. That's the problem with lots of Bibles, man. They need some pledge on top of them because they ain't been touched since last week. Okay, listen, the Bible is not an accessory. You know what an accessory is? Like something you tote around that, like my wife, she accessorizes with jewelry or a, a kit purse. You know, uh, not, that's not what I'm talking about. The Bible shouldn't be an accessory in what you got going on. The Bible ought to be something that you use and read and apply. It ought to be something that ought to be wore out at your house. But also believe, guys, I believe you ought to get the Word of God and post it at your house somewhere in a picture. And if you can't afford a picture, get some post notes. And if you can't afford some post notes, I'll give you some. In a pen, write the Word of God down and post it all over your house in your bathroom mirror. The things that you are dealing with, the things that you are struggling with. Post those things and don't just put them there as a decoration, but read them. And say, Lord, help me to live this today. We need the Word of God. We need to be saturated with the Word of God. I get so tired of all the things that we are saturated with in this life. This life needs to be saturated with the Word of God. God says that we have a choice between life and prosperity or death and destruction. We need to choose to love God's word and keep his commandments. We can choose life. We can choose a life that God blesses. We need to, and we find that through the word of God. I, I want to read to you in Deuteronomy chapter 32, Moses' closing remarks after this whole book, which, you know, Deuteronomy basically means a 
a, a second, a, I call it a second helping <laughs> or a second portion. All it does, Deuteronomy just reiterates all the laws that were in the first uh, three chapters or three, first three books of the Bible uh, after Genesis, so Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And so it's kind of a re-going over of things. And as Moses begins to close, it says, When Moses had finished speaking all these words to Israel, he said to them, Take to your heart all the words which with which I am warning you today, which you shall command your sons to observe carefully, even all the words of this law. For it is not an idle word for you, but listen to this, this is cool. Indeed, it is your life. And by this word, you will prolong your days in the land which you are about to cross, the Jordan to possess. Do you have life this morning? I'm talking about real life. And for those of you who are in Christ, are you going to the word of life? Are you going to the word of life in the decisions that you are making in this life that you are living? Or do you just say, well, that's just how it is, y'all? No, it just ain't how it is. What does the word of God, what does it do? And how is it serving in you and your family's life right now? Are you teaching these things? Men, are you leading your families the way you ought to? Are you looking to the Word of God? Are you repenting, turning from, in accordance with what the Word of God tells you? Guys, sometimes we just got to suck it up and say, you know what? I've been called out on this. The Word has called me out. I I've got to turn from it. I've got to repent. I've got to change my ways for the glory of Jesus. I've been shown something today. Do you have life? I'm talking about real life. Let me tell you, this morning, it all starts with understanding and need of a Savior. We live in a world, again, where people, they want to look to other people and say, well, at least I'm not as sorry as that sapsucker. You watch the news and you see the terrible things people do to other people. And a lot of times you'll say, man, I am so glad I am not like that or I haven't done that. But the fact of the matter is, is when we really dig down deep, we recognize we are no better. We are no better than anybody else sitting next to us. If you think of the worst person right now you can think of in the world, the sorriest person that you have ever known, realize this, when it comes to sin, in, in, in the eyes of God, your sin and their sin is the same. Oh, I don't like that, Nate. The Bible says in Romans 3.10 that there are none that are righteous. <laughs> Even if you th are self-righteous, it, does, it doesn't really matter what you think, guys. The Bible says that there are none that are righteous. No, not one. You see, our standard is Jesus. Unless anybody in here can say that they measure up to Jesus, you fall under, there's not one that's righteous. And I'm just going to tell you, there's nobody silly enough, I don't think, other than maybe a small child or an adult who acts like a child that would raise their hands and say, yes, I am as righteous and as holy as Jesus Christ is. On our own, we can't be made righteous. We can't be made right. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Guys, with that sin comes a separation between you and a holy and righteous judge. And mark my words, you will stand before him one day and you will be judged. And it will be based, your judgment will be based solely on a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Whether or not you turned to him, repented of your sins, and called him Lord. Or whether you don't. Let me tell you, the beautiful thing about the gospel Jesus shed his blood, so you ain't got to worry about all the rest of that. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Praise the Lord for that, because I know what a screw-up I am. And I've talked to some of y'all, so I know where y'all are kind of at too. So we're all in a bad deal. Thank goodness for Jesus. But a lot of you are still not convinced. And you say, Nate, I am not really that bad of a guy. I'm actually a good guy. No, I'm sorry, buddy. You're not. Because, again, you've got to compare yourself to the standard. 
a holy and righteous God in flesh, Jesus Christ, when you compare yourself to him, how close are you? Not very close, y'all. <laughs> Not close by a long shot. Romans 3.20 tells us that through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And when I think of the law, I think back to the Ten Commandments. I think of the things that I read from the book of Exodus in chapter 20, and I think about, have I done these things? Has anybody never broken a Ten Commandment in here? Let me ask a better question. Raise your hand if you've ever broken a Ten Commandment. Look around, guys. Yeah. Some of you didn't raise your hand because you've never broken one. Uh, I believe that's the lying deal. Um, you shouldn't lie. You see, under the law, guys, we're guilty of sin. There ain't nobody that stands innocent. And because of our sins, we need a Savior. We need to be made right. The beautiful thing is, is the Bible tells us in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you have life this morning? Real life. Have you looked to the word of God? in all things are you taking all thoughts captive everything you think about every ounce of everything you go through in the course of a day that you make a decision on are you sending that first and filtering that first through the word of god or do you one of those people that just say that's just how it is do you have life this morning this morning i don't know where you're at where you've been what you've done I don't really care, to be honest with you. The only thing I care about is the gospel message in you. Do you know Jesus as Lord and Savior? Is he Lord? Is he life in you? This morning after we pray, there's going to be some guys down front love to talk to you more, share more with you what the scriptures has to say. Maybe you want to know about baptism or being a member of this church or maybe you want to ask about the auction deal. I don't know. Maybe you just need to be prayed for. Whatever it is you've got going on today, I pray that you would not step foot off this property without getting things right with the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't wait till it's too late, y'all. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for the opportunity you give us to read it, <laughs> to live it. Father, I pray that I would be a better man, a better father, a better husband, a better pastor, Lord, a better worker for your kingdom based on what your word says I need to be. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would empower this church, Lord, not for our glory, but for your glory, that many, many, many may hear the gospel message. In your name we pray. Amen.